Hello everyone. Hope you're all um, heading back after our short break so we can get started with the next second part of our workshop today. Uh, we have a really interesting um, activity, interactive activity session that will be, um, so it's on traditional indigenous perspectives together with the feminist decolonizing, decolonizing perspectives. This will be led by the Center for Interdisciplinary Environmental Justice. We have um, uh, we have with us here Emma Harnson, uh, Marlena Brito, uh, Milan, um, and I, I'm not sure if we have, uh, we have Jessica Ng and Leslie here with us, but I will let them um, introduce themselves as well as what the session will be about. So uh, without further ado, if I could invite Emma, are you are you here? Uh, maybe we'll just give them a few uh, minutes. Can you can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Excellent. Hello, Emma. Hi. Thank you so much for the introduction. All right. So actually, uh, Jessica is going to start us off this morning. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Sorry. I'm just trying to get the presentation right. It's not looking quite how I expected, but we'll do it. it, is never, it is. Uh, are you looking for the, the share con like content? No, or? I'm just trying to make it so that it is um, it is full screen, but also that I can share it. Uh, okay, this. Will be in an empty Um All right. Thank you all for um, being here and attending our workshop. Really excited to um, share it with you all. Um, this is going to be called to defiance: tools for decolonial feminist science. And we are. Can I? Can okay. There you go. Yeah. You can go full screen. Um, yeah. Um, we are the Center for Interdisciplinary Environmental Justice, or SIEGE for short. Um, we are um, mostly based in uh, San Diego, um, California, which is um, traditionally Kumeyaay land. Um, we also have members in other parts of California and the United States and uh, Mexico. Uh, my name is Jessica Ng. I'm a PhD student at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And I'll pass the mic to everyone else to introduce themselves. Good morning. This is Emma speaking. Um, my pronouns are she, hers, and I am a postdoc in the Geological Sciences Department at Stanford University. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Marlene Brito Millan. I'm a postdoc uh, through the University of California Institute for Mexico in the United States, based in uh, Universidad Autónoma de Guerrero, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Good morning, everyone. Buenos dias. My name is Leslie Quintanilla. I am currently um, standing on occupied Ohlone territory in uh, the Bay Area, San Francisco, California. I'm a professor of women and gender studies, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Thanks, everyone. Um, so a few logistics um, just to get us oriented before we get into the material. Um, we had a survey sent out um, to get to know the participants a little bit, um, you know, where you're from, what um, information you have coming into this workshop. So if you haven't had a chance to fill it out already, um, please take a moment to do that. Um, we will be pausing a few times throughout the workshop to um, ask a few questions. 
and we'll, we'll like you to um, respond to those in the chat and then we'll pull out some of those responses and sort of discuss them um, as we go along. And then at the end, there will be some time um, for us to have um, a more um, in-person discussion where we'll um, ask for people who would like to speak as well as um, people to um, put their responses in the chat and um, and go ahead and unmute you. Um, so the outline for this workshop, we're going to start with a discussion of uh, privilege and oppression. Um, then we'll talk about scientific colonialism. We'll um, analyze a few examples. Um, the first is nuclear bomb testing in Micronesia. The second is uh, lithium mining and uh, so-called green technology. And then finally, we will talk about what resistance looks like and um, this framework of decolonial feminist science. Um, so content warning for the, the workshop, we will be talking about um, some birth defects and nuclear fallout. Um, so please uh, take care of yourselves if those um, will affect you. All right, everyone, thank you for, for joining us. We wanted to first start off with acknowledging that we are living in a global moment of death, suffering, and sickness. And this is not just from climate change or even just the impacts from COVID-19, which is a kind of global indicator of where our health and um, health services lie, depending on where we're at. But we're also living through the structures of inequality quality that has led to the disproportionate impacts on the health and livelihood of specifically Black, Indigenous, and people of color around the world. It's also important to foreground that white supremacy and its structures are killing Black people around the world, just like structures of white supremacy like borders are killing people who are suffering from the impacts of economic, political, and environmental oppression. We want to say and we want to foreground that we are all implicated in these structures, specifically even in the fields that might seem disconnected, like the sciences and marine spatial planning. So today we want to acknowledge that we have to address our complicity, but also our possibilities to uplift these structures that can provide life instead of providing structures of death. So for this first section, um, we want to talk about privilege and oppression. Um, for many of you here, your identities have provided you a lens through which you can view your purpose in your career. Some of you may understand specific struggles that you or your community has endured, and you might have even chosen this career that we call uh, marine spatial planning in order to help, whatever help might mean. For others here, um, you might have never interrogated the relationship between you and your identities and the relationship between them and your career. So we're gonna attempt at pulling those apart and unpacking that relationship here, um, especially with uh, the survey that you all generously um, were able to, to, to take. So in the survey, um, we asked a lot of you to answer very specific questions about who you are and how you identify. And these are the results to those questions. So most of you here in the room um, said that uh, you haven't uh, necessarily felt discrimination because of your race or your ethnicity. Only 32% of you said yes. Um, most of you are not men. So 62.7 uh, of you are not men. 71% um, of you said that you are heterosexual. And 97% of you said that you identify with the gender you've been assigned at birth. Um, most of you have not been discriminated against uh, for your religious beliefs, and most of you have not felt poor, but a significant of you have, 40%. Um, most of you uh, said that you, or one second, um, have a passport that can allow you to travel, and also most of you um, don't live your everyday life with temporary or permanent disabilities. Mm -hmm. Uh, like this is a early career, you know, space, uh, most of you said that you are not older than most of your colleagues, 
and most of you have not been mocked for your accent. And this is really important for us to, to understand about who's in the room and how most of you have or haven't experienced different forms of oppression in your day-to-day -day life. And so we want to foreground that our interpersonal experiences with our identities are tied to institutional and ideological structures that determine a hierarchy of value for our identities and how we experience the world. And all of these are interconnected. It's not just individual isolated experiences, but they actually result in greater institutional and structural forms of life and death that lead to a lot of our communities being targeted for death. And so um, many folks who, who were who answered as being at the end of structural racism, structural white supremacy, structural sexism, structural transphobia, know what it's like to be in a room where power is decided by those that do not look like you, do not hold the same identity identities as you or the same um, experiences as you. So this matters for when we think about research knowledge production, policy creation in its relationship to power and how those powers create systems of domination and exclusion. And those systems of power are patriarchy, racism, colonization, capitalism, heterosexism, ableism. And what we're saying is that, that in order to unpack these powers, we have to think about the antidotes to those powers, such as feminism, racism, decolonization. And so for our proposal to kind of ignite a disruption to these powers is to think about a decolonial feminist science that can disrupt these systems as knowledge production that exclude and dominate communities that are vulnerable around the world in our fields. And so we are proposing that we think about and use a decolonial feminist science in our work. What is a decolonial feminist science? We are proposing that there should be no illusion of object objectivity when we're thinking and doing our research. We have to recognize each of our positionalities as we're doing our oh, sure research. We also have to center relationships that are horizontal and not vertical. We also have to aim to undermine the exploitation of people and nature wherever that is, and also how to redirect resources and power to communities that can be useful for resistance. Also, in our specific case, we want to think about a solidarity with indigenous epistemologies and forms of knowledge production that are not exploitative, appropriative, or even um, targeted for its destruction and genocide or epistemicide. And then we also aim for a decolonial form of feminist science where these sciences are in the service of indigenous people's agency over their land, their water, and their livelihood. And so throughout this presentation, we're going to talk a little bit more about what this looks like as an antidote to forms of colonial sciences. Hey, can you hear me? Can you see my screen? Yes. <clears throat> okay. Uh, thanks, sorry for the fumble. <laughs> um, in this part of the presentation, we're going to move into a conversation about how the colonial history of the world impacts the way that we experience it and live in it today. So we're going to use a really simple definition of colonialism the act of one nation controlling another for economic gain. And we know that this has occurred in different ways, depending on where and when you are in the history of the world, but the entirety of the human and non-human world that we live in has been shaped by colonialism. And it doesn't work on its own. Colonialism uses other oppressive systems to accomplish its work. So the role of racism and patriarchy and the dominance of humans over nature are really integral um, into the work of colonialism. 
And these are complex and cooperating systems that are entangled in our daily lives in ways that are just so embedded and complex that it can be difficult to understand exactly where and how they're operating. But we know that it's imperative that we figure out how to detangle and extract them because at their core is violence um, against land and people and water. So here I'm going to present a framework that you can use to guide yourself through sort of a personal investigation of how colonialism continues to exist and continues to cause harm through spheres of scientific investigation and also the associated sectors of work where, where science is important, like you know, NGOs, conservation and management, uh, research and technical development. Um, this framework was developed by a professor at the University of California, San Diego, B.T. Werner, and it works by first identifying the historical context of your discipline and then looking through functional and dynamical connections that exist between your science and colonialism. So the historical context of your discipline, you want to think about its origin stories and its early practitioners and then ask what their relationship is and was to colonialism. And I'm going to use a really famous example to illustrate this, the one of Charles Darwin traveling around the world on the HMS Beagle. And what many people might not know is that was actually an imperial vessel, and those routes were the routes of expansion for the British Empire. And because of this relationship, this context, uh, many of the, the parts of the language and the systems that were developed by Darwin as he fathered biogeography and borrow from the language of imperialism, like the use of kingdom, class, and order in a hierarchy of biological classification. And so then we want to ask, what are the functional connections between colonialism and your science? And by this, I mean, how does the mission of colonialism, that work, depend on the work of the science and vice versa? How does the science depend on colonialism? And in our example of biogeography, empire was providing funding and the routes that, that the voyages would take, as long as an ethos of like exploration, right? And clout, by which I mean a, a high social status, providing all of that to the scientific researchers. And in return, the field of biogeography was providing botanical and place-based knowledge, which made the work of colonization much more profitable if you can think about things like coffee and tea and sugar plantations as utilizing that botanical knowledge, as well as providing direct training to naval officers who later became experts in biogeography. And we can think about some of the examples, uh, some further examples of this, um, like how specimens are collected, right? And, and this is a type of appropriation. You know, if you think about it symbolically, the act of removing an animal from the landscape and placing it in a jar is a type of appropriation. But also this involves the process of extracting um, a being from the place that it's a part of and viewing it instead as, uh, as a, you know, a separate kind of entity, right? So removing the meaning in the context. Um, it also involves renaming both the, the animals and the places. And these kinds of things elevate one way of knowing, a reductionist, quantified, statistical way of knowing over other types of ways of knowing, like relationality and cosmology. And so in this way, the science is actually doing the work of colonization at the same time. And when we think about it like this, it's, it's actually a natural consequence and not an accident that feels like social Darwinism or the racist science eugenics um, arose out of this, out of this field. And then finally, we're going to look at the dynamical connection. So dynamical connections means the dynamics of the system, how it responds to stimuli and what that produces in the system in the future. And you can look at that for the two systems, colonialism and the science operating in parallel, and then think about how they interact with each other. Do they speed each other up or do they slow each other down? And so in the example of empire, we go and extract resources that accumulates wealth. The wealth allows us to go and extract further resources, and this creates a positive feedback cycle. In the version of science operating nearby, we have data collection being used to produce new questions and new technologies that further the production of data 
and this creates a, a, a parallel positive feedback cycle. And both of these things are operating, you know, in relation to each other in a way that concentrates power, either as wealth or as knowledge at the top in a small collect collection of hands, you know, and away from the people. So um, now we're going to take a break from this information and we want to connect with you guys. Um, we are going to display some of the results of the polls and we also would really appreciate if people are interested in um, participating in the chat. So we would like you to answer um, in the chat one or two of these questions that we have displayed on the screen. Um, what's the colonial history of the land or the land where you're, you come from? Um, and maybe think about that in context of your identity as well. Um, and also, what are the origin stories and iconic figures in your field? And if you know how they are connected um, to colonialism. And so we're going to take about five minutes here. And um, as you, you know, if you want to participate in the chat, that would be awesome. And, uh, and we'll try and read some of your responses out loud so that we get to dialogue with them a little bit. <clears throat> and I actually can't see the chat. Here, maybe I can. Okay, got it. All right, so um, let's see. And also, I'd like to show here in my slide that there's some. So here's some responses from the um, the the poll that we took. Also, as you guys take the opportunity to to write some things in the in the chat. And this is um. This is the result of the question, has your homeland colonized other parts of the world? Um, and has your homeland been colonized by an outside power? And in addition, um, we had some really interesting, you know, specific answers to this. Um, some people, if I remember correctly, you know, referenced uh, really early versions of colonization, for example, like the, the Romans and the Normans. And I think that's an important example because it illustrates that this is actually a like a, you know something that's been going on for a really long time colonization is a, is a well-practiced well-honed uh tool <clears throat> and uh and there was some interesting answer that said that um their homeland was the product of colonization or that it had both colonized and then or been colonized and then become a colonizer another example of feedback <clears throat> Uh, so many different examples here. We have people from Canada. Um, look, Canada has absolutely uh, been a colonized place, and we have so many examples of indigenous people in Canada fighting back for their like um, their land today. Mozambique, Brazil, <clears throat> India. Wow, the chat is coming in so quickly, guys. This is amazing. Um, and I'd like to say also that um, this is like a reference for all of us to to continue looking at. Um, I would like to also point out that um, apartheid in South Africa is, really, is a really important um, uh, site for us to understand that racism still hasn't been eradicated even post um, legal apartheid. So that's a great um, example of colonization um, currently. And there are very t various types of colonization. So there's settler colonialism, there's franchise colonization, and it looks differently depending on um, on the different processes. But but both and and most um, definitely subscribe to forms of uh, supremacy, be it white supremacy, um, uh, gender binarism, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And adding to that, also you know neocolonialism and the way that we have um yeah there's uh like economic colonization that continues to happen um and there was a paper published recently that looked at science colonialism um and they saw that m many of the papers coming out of um you know formerly colonized lands were you know co-authored with primarily um people from the colonizing <laughs> countries. <clears throat> so here's here's also the results of the poll um, showing the scientific disciplines that everyone has studied. 
um, we have you know many people studying biology and ecology, um, and of course oceanography um, and statistics. Um, a lot of people are studying chemistry and computer science and geography here, um, and many people working in conservation and in education, government, and research. Um, also in outreach and in policy and in management. And overall, um, many people haven't you know, interrogated specifically the disciplines that they work in um, and their connections to colonialism. <clears throat> Thank you for the folks in the chat who are sharing even the effects of colonization as it has definitely taken an impact in terms of our language, our cultures, um, our foods, our ways of being um, every day. So even acknowledging that we're having this conversation in English as one of the dominating languages, if not the domina dominating language of the world, says a lot about how we are relating to each other through linguistic colonization. I see someone mentioning that they're uh, a geographer and that the very basis of geography was to establish um, colonies, um, but that actually, you know, in, in their roots, in their family roots, um, the, the people who they, you know, come from are also, you know, writers, geographers, and ecologists themselves, but without that purpose of, of creating domination. That's like a, a really beautiful point to make as well. Um, you know, in preparing for this, uh, I mean, I'm a, I'm a geologist and there's like a very clear uh, connection between the Manifest Destiny um, work of the United States government and the creation of the US Geologic Survey. And beyond that, then the extraction that has been used to displace indigenous people from their land. Um, <clears throat> and so this is like, you know, as I, as I was preparing for this, I was also looking at the origin stories of your different um, disciplines that you work in and finding over and over again, these parallels like, um, like you pointed out here. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. Thank you. We'll have more um, discussion questions in the upcoming slides as well. Yes. Um, Marlena, why don't you take us to section three? Sounds good. Uh, one moment. Okay, I hope you all can see my screen. Hold in a moment. Okay, so again, thank you all for your participation um, uh, w with really answering and, and thinking through a lot of these very important concepts and the intersections, obviously, with our, our identities and with our disciplines. Um, part of you know the reason that we're doing all this is to work towards really unveiling many of the systemic uh, structures uh, that continue to this day. Uh, some folks have mentioned, you know, neo-colonial uh, structures within uh, some of their responses. And of course, the, the current global system that's in place, all of that was structured and is influenced by the colonial um, and racist capitalist um, legacies. Um, all, of the, all of that still remains. And so uh, for this section, uh, what we want to do is to share a couple of examples, but basically ignoring the central role of race and colonialism in science and policy precludes an accurate understanding of the modern state system, globalization, and marine spatial planning. Uh, and how this applies to science uh, is tremendously important. Science acts on colonial logics of racial hierarchy and Anglo-European cultures as the zenith of human progress. Um, this, we see this uh, come up again and again throughout the scientific process. Um, so one thing, so what I wanna do is give an example of the intersection of science with empire um, it, within in the context, context of, of the Pacific Islands, specifically uh, thinking about nuclear testing in Micronesia, which happened during the Cold War 
uh, which occurred from 1946 to 1958. Uh, to situate ourselves in, in the location, we're talking about the heart of the uh, Pacific Ocean, um, approximately uh, 8,000 kilometers uh, due west of uh, North America, um, specifically focusing on uh, the Marshall Island chain. Um, generally speaking, though, within this region, uh, we see that there was a Pacific nuclear uh, basically a nuclear arms race um, occurring uh, from the British, French, and U.S. empires in this region, which decided that this was the place where they were going to test, right, scientific, test their scientific uh, advancements of technology. Um, and again, the area that I'm focusing on for today is in the Marshall Islands, which was uh, impacted by U.S. nuclear bomb testing. So what we have um, are Pacific, Pacific Islander bodies and their island marine environments uh, that had inhabited these regions for millennia, you know, had subsisted from, uh, you know, oceanic and uh, reef systems in a way that they were, had co-adapted for hundreds and thousands of years. Uh, unfortunately, this area was deemed a sacrifice for the good of mankind and to end all world, war world, world wars, excuse me, as they were told. Um, and, and the reality is that they were largely viewed um, as empty um, or non-inhabited expanses that could be wastelanded. Uh, wastelanded being that, that they could be destroyed and dumped upon merely because of the racialized and devalued bodies that inhabit these areas. And so, uh, if we uh, zoom into what happened in 1954, the, U the U.S. Uh, carried out a whole series of nuclear bomb testing, uh, bomb testing within the, the northern uh, atoll uh, chain, uh, as you can see circled in red here. The largest single nuclear US, U.S. explosion was the Bravo detonation, which occurred on Bikini Atoll. Um, and that explosion had the, was equivalent to a destructive cap capacity of more than 1,000 times that of the Hiroshima bomb. Um, and so what you have is Bikini Islanders being displaced uh, from their atoll uh, just before the detonation. Um, and once the detonation happened, um, you, you know, the, you see a, a series of mostly white men uh, scientists, you know, sit on their uh, beach chairs with uh, eye protection to witness firsthand, right, the, the largest uh, nuclear explosion. Now, the, the other kind of, uh, it's not even unfortunate, it's almost a cynical reality that, that we have here too, is that the fallout pattern of this nuclear bomb um, was carried towards the east by the winds. And uh, the scientists that were carrying out these detonations knew that the wind was going to carry in that direction of inhabited atolls. So the, really the decision uh, to irradiate uh, additionally the northern Marshall Islands uh, was really a decision to irradiate the people who were still living on them for the sake of knowing what the effects um, of, of radiation would be on human bodies. So what were those effects? So the immediate effects, you have diarrhea, vomiting, hair loss, skin burdens and lesions that reach the bone. Uh, between 1954 and 1958, one in three births resulted in fetal death. Cancer rates were 10 times greater than in, non -ex in the non-exposed population. Um, from a feminist perspective, um, what were the effects on the bodies of women and children? Well, we have accounts and testimony of women that would give birth to, as they would say, things we could only describe as octopuses, apples, turtles, and other things that in their that, that they could use to identify within their experience. Um, additionally, there's accounts of jellyfish babies, babies that had no bones in their bodies and were born with transparent skin where they could see their brains and hearts beating. It's just really horrific impacts on the bodies of, of children, right? And, and really reproductive um, harm that has no, no uh, measure or at least monetary um, compensation that, that could ever um, uh, account for, for that harm. Uh, what I, if we think about applying the critical analysis framework, that we that Emma uh, just shared with you all in, in terms of thinking of historical context, functional connections, and dynamical connections. The historical context that that in which this situation um, 
of the intersection between science and empire and technology occurred was again, we were within the Cold War nuclear arms race. We have a context in which colonialism and emptying of, of environments and wastelanding was a very uh, active uh, process um, and assumptions that were made right by, by scientists and the empire pushing this type of work. And we also have patriarchal structures in place that consider women and nature as viable. In terms of functional connections, uh, the militarization and, and colonialism here, these intersections of science um, depend on each other to function, right? The military provides the funding for this type of technology and testing um, and science. It keeps informing and further developing that technology for the military and colonial gains or aims. And finally, in terms of dynamical connections, uh, we see that continuing impacts of radiation increase dependency on the U.S. and call for further scientific and policy ne negotiations. Um, an example of this is the Compact of Free Associ Association, uh, which are treaties that provide economic support um, in exchange for U.S. strategic access to waters and airspace. So this has important consequences for obviously military, uh, fisheries industry, trade routes, and com commerce, and where all of those are laid out. But we see that dynamical connection, that feedback loop where if you uh, create the dependency upon you as in this case, um, the presence of the US, then you're able to uh, negotiate for access, you know, through, through uh, paying for folks and providing economic support, access to, to waters and space. Um, so with that, uh, you know, we will return uh, to a little bit of this towards the end, but I want to now pass on to the next example, which I'll let Jessica talk about. All right, thanks, Marlena. Um, so we can also apply this analysis to um, to lithium mining and. Um, green or really greenwashed technology that's supposed to save us from climate change, um, which is you know one of the defining features of this historical moment and something that I'm sure we are all thinking about in um, in our our place of work and um, and everything. Um, so you know schematics like these are uh, quite familiar, um, explaining climate change and global warming through this greenhouse effect that's being enhanced by anthropogenic uh, carbon dioxide. Um, what it doesn't show, of course, is that the driving force behind those CO2 emissions isn't just, a, you know, humanity, um, but a specific, uh, sorry, let's go, colonial capitalist system um, that, you know, steals resources from um, one part of the world um, to enrich another and um, always needs to be getting richer and producing more. So this incomplete narrative of climate change leads us to solutions that perpetuate the same system, one of these being um, electric vehicles um, and other lithium-based energy storage technologies. 75% of the world's lithium is housed in the so-called lithium triangle. Um, spanning the extremely dry Andean highlands of Chile, Argentina, and Bolivia. Um, so the geomorphology and the climate of this region um, creates these unique salt flats and salt lakes, like you see in the picture of the flamingos. The way that lithium is mined here is by mining groundwater. So precipitation carries um, minerals from the surrounding soil and volcanic rock, um, including lithium and potassium and others, um, as it moves through the ground and collects in these closed basins. Um, and so over thousands and thousands of years, these minerals built up and become highly concentrated. So the mining companies come in and they pump this groundwater from underground up to the surface into these um, big shallow pools. Um, to get a sense of scale for this picture, you can kind of see um, very faintly some roads curving sort of to the left and then another one that's uh, straighter um, towards the right hand side. Um, so the so they pump the groundwater up and they just let it evaporate under the sun and in the dry air so that all the minerals um, become even more concentrated and then they can um, they can process them. Uh, 
uh, I'm not wanting to annotate the slides. How do I get out of this? Okay. Um, so the the groundwater isn't being replenished at a rate to keep up with extraction and evaporation. It's basically a non-renewable resource. Um, so it's being depleted, and the indigenous uh, Likanantai people who have lived here since time immemorial are worried about the effects of, um, of this water extraction on all of the life in this desert that depends on the scarce water. Um, they understand themselves to be part of the ecosystem. They're not separate from it. Um, so the, the stromatolites that live in these salt lakes that are analogous to early forms of life on Earth, they, they know it to be their ancestors. And if any part of the ecosystem is harmed or dies out, they too are harmed um, and they too die. You know, the flamingos and the grasses and the llamas and the people, they're all connected. Um, so we can look at this um, situation through the um, analytical framework that we met up before. Um, so historically, we're in this moment where climate change is this existential threat um, that is really a feature that grew out of colonialism and um, now is motivating with groundwater mining. Um, this mining supports uh, continued wealth accumulation and economic growth in the global north by stealing from and destroying indigenous lands um, and also by maintaining the, um, the nation states of Chile and Argentina and, you know, in case you missed it, um, look into what happened with the coup in Bolivia. Um, and then dynamically, we can see a feedback loop where under colonialism, we have this dominant knowledge system that tells the story of the origins of land life and, and people on this planet. And we understand climate change through this knowledge system, through carbon dioxide concentrations, and we understand the environment through this view of humans as separate from nature and above nature. Um, this, this knowledge system devalues indigenous cosmologies, which are generally more relational and reciprocal. Um, and so this knowledge system that got us into the climate crisis and then, you know, is, is um, how and why we're mining for green technology um, that's supposed to get us out of climate change uh, comes from, you know, that, that knowledge system where we engineer our way against nature. Um, and so now it's physically destroying elements of those indigenous cosmologies. It's threatening the brines that are their origins and, um, and just reinforcing this epistemological or knowledge system dominance and erasure. Um, so I want to point out this um, parallel between the two examples that we've talked about, which is that they create sacrifice zones for, for profit and, and so-called progress. Um, so in the first case, um, the motivation, you know, to, to bomb the Marshall Islands was supposedly to end all war. The motivation here is to end climate change, and that's leading us to lithium mining. Um, and in these, in these two cases, we have colonialism. Um, you know, for uh, hundreds of years and ongoing, that creates a crisis, world war um, and climate change, um, and then this crisis um, justifies the creation of these sacrifice zones. And um, so the, you know, the people who are in these sacrifice zones who are fighting for their, their life and their, um, their history and culture and everything, um, you know, when of the Likanantai uh, community members in the, um, the Lithium Triangle and the Slide of the Common Chile um, emphasized to us that the, the advancement of one society must not mean the destruction of another. So um, now we'd like to do another um, discussion in the chat. Um, or actually, we're going to do that at the end. End, I think. Um, so let's have, let's have people um, see if they'd like to, to respond to these questions in the chat. Um, can you identify any of the ways that colonialism has shaped the field that you work in, and if you have an example of sacrifice zones or wasteland gang that you would, you know, are aware of and want to share with us, um, please do. I see actually we, we already have um, seen some people bring that up in the chat. Um, and we have like a, a few more slides of content, and then we would like to open it up to a larger discussion. So maybe in the interest of getting to that space, um, 
you know, people can go ahead and respond and then we can we can we can have a bigger conversation at the end. As we you know going through the, the slides. Great. Okay. So go ahead and respond to this question and then we'll get to them um, at the end of it. Um, so again, just looking at the um, the field that folks are working in that maybe you can speak to about how colonial colonialism has shaped um, your field of biology or ecology, um, geography, etc. Um, so it doesn't have to um, be this way, right? So this is where we are intervening at Siege as an organization, and maybe some of you are um, as well. Um, so we, uh, Siege, we're standing with the indigenous communities who are struggling to protect their groundwater from lithium mining and you know, their land and their ecosystems. Um, we're in solidarity with the community's struggles, their legal cases, and their um, direct actions that they've taken, for example, um, blockading the highway. And we're doing that through um, solidarity science. We have a research project that is um, my PhD uh, project that's looking at how groundwater levels have changed over time in, um, in one of these basins. Um, and then we're also locally organizing here in um, California in the United States where the demand for lithium is largely coming from and we're, we're intervening in this climate movement that is calling for an uncritical expansion of renewable energy. 